So we will start. The colleagues, their friends, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today for this new webinar organized by the ENS School Base section and dedicated today to the orbitozygomatic approach, a very interesting approach that will be first anatomically described by uh, Stefan Lieber working in Paris, and then the surgical aspect will be developed by uh, Sébastien Frelich, who is also the head of department in La Riboisière Hospital in Paris. He will join us uh, in a few minutes. So, Stéphane, I give you the floor up to you to describe as nicely as you do every time the anatomical aspect related to this approach. Please, Stéphane. And thank you again to be with us. Every time you are with us, and uh, it's a very hard work that you, you make for the skill based section. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much in any case uh, for having me. It's, uh, well, it, it, a bit of work to prepare this, but it's, it's a pleasure and it, uh, it's always good to revise those things and putting it together. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. All right. So today we'll be talking about the uh, orbitozygomatic approach or the frontal orbitozygomatic approach, um, which is an extension of the uh, Terrional approach, one of the approaches um, of the anterolateral corridor. Um, and this is an approach which uh, extends the frontoterrional or frontotemporal terrional um, uh, corridor inferiorly and creates space by uh, removing some of the bone uh, of the supralateral orbit and the temporal floor, um, which changes angles for the intracranial uh, work but also allows um, access to the orbit and also to the extra dural extracranial space of the pterygopalatine fossa, the infratemporal fossa pathologies extending from the intracranial to the extracranial space. So this is a, a one-piece FDOZ or a one-piece frontal orbital zygomatic uh, craniotomy, which again is, is centered around uh, it's, it's the extension of the terrional approach and you see all the bony landmarks of the terrional approach here in this craniotomy plus the frontolateral uh, um, part of the orbit and the zygomatic arch, which has been uh, removed here. You can see the orbit, which is uh, opened in its lateral and superior aspect. You can see also the extension into the extracranial, uh, extracranial space. We'll come back to this later. What you also recognize in this picture is the trajectory you, uh, you see here in the, in the level of the flow of the middle fossa. You can see the Petrus apex, you can see the dorsum cellae. In fact, uh, one of the first histo um, historic description of this approach by Akuba is in fact um, done for, for clipping for microsurgical control of Petrus apex, um, Bezler, um, Bezler apex uh, aneurysm, which, which is uh, this region. And you can see all the extensions feasible uh, for this approach and also reducing, obviously this is a main goal in, in scabby surgery, one of the main strategies reducing um, mobilization and, and traction and uh, retraction of, of intra or extradural um, brain tissue. This is um, all of this in this talk will, as in previous talks, will be purely anatomy. It's not meant to be a, a surgical um, description of indication and technical nuances. It's just to give you the audience um, an idea of the anatomy. Some of the anatomy, obviously, in anatomy can be destructive in order to better understand and to depict the anatomy for um, better understanding of the surgical approach, which, be, uh, which is in masterly hands in, uh, in the second talk by uh, Professor Frilich in, uh, in 20 minutes, I guess. So this, again, is a one-piece uh, FTOZ. You see the extension of the terrional approach, removal of the superior, uh, superlateral part of the orbit, extension into the anterior fossa, removal of the zygomatic arch, and you see the extensive uh, mobilization of soft tissues, um, which is necessary for this approach. We'll come back to this later. And as I said, this is an approach, an extension uh, of the uh, terrional or frontotemporal parietal approach, which is centered around the, the sylvian fissure, which exposes um, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, insular sylvian fissure. And the F2UZ with its basal exposure allows um, a more anterior um, trajectory, as I said, for example, to, towards the, the, uh, the posterior clinoid and the posterior fossa also into the orbit pathology extending into the infratemporal fossa or pterygopalatine fossa or any pathology that might um, combine all these compartments. 
This is a view, just very little into dural anatomy in this talk. This is a SCOBIS webinar just to, for you, familiarize, uh, you're familiarized with this, with this view, a right side of the chiasma, lamina terminalis, anterior, middle, and, and um, terminal carotid here, the SCA and PCA, third nerve um, in between, fourth nerve running towards the tendon anteriorly. This is a, this is a perspective which is uh, feasible with a mini terrional or just a smaller variant. And this is uh, one of the extension, again, this is an anatomical dissection without, uh, with the brain um, itself removed, just to give you an impression of the more posterior, anteroposterior um, trajectory of this, um, of the, uh, the tent oculomotor system here, the oculomotor nerve existing from the interpeduncular system. You have the PCA, SCA, dorsal clinoid, um, Dosum celli here. This is the this is uh, the region, which, as I said, was originally described by by Hakuba in one of his um, first description of this um, extension. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, and also sometimes uh, for the patient, surgery doesn't start here with this nice exposure. We have to uh, get to this point, and this requires, as I said, um, control of the extracranial tissues, which is uh, extensive. We we have uh, the pericranium elevated here. We have the the, the skin removed um, anteriorly. We have uh, co complete control of the temporalis muscle, which is elevated and, and uh, mobilized more laterally. Um, and of course, in this, in this uh, cutaneous flap, we have the facial nerve, um, vascular supply, nervous supply for both of the skin and um, the muscle. All this needs to be controlled. And um, I will briefly cover this, um, in, this in this slide. As you see the anatomy here, this is a uh, tragus temporal, um, temporal artery and um, the, the superior aspect of the, of the parotid gland where the facial nerve um, exits. These are well, running to the frontoparietal muscle, but uh, anatomically correct, these are temporal branches extending, ascending towards uh, the perium, the, uh, the orbicularis oculi and the frontoparietal muscle. Um, and these are obviously running in the fat pad, which has been dissected here. This is just to give you a, an orientation of tragus, zygomatic arch, temporal artery, facial nerve branches, and the lateral canthus, which is here. And you see this uh, surgical depiction. Uh, I will not, again, not cover surgical details of, of extensive uh, mobilization, as placement of, of uh, incisions, and so forth. Um, but usually, you, you need to connect your inferior, uh, inferior incision, which is usually at the, at the level, since we are mobilizing the, the uh, the, the zygomatic arch needs to be mobilized um, mid, at least towards the level of the, of the uh, zygoma. Um, and you need a contralateral or a midline, uh, mid pupillary line uh, incision to have um, mobilization of these soft tissues. This incision probably is already a bit too anterior for me. Um, if you incise just uh, in front of the cartilage of the tragus, usually you end up posterior to the, uh, to the temporal artery and not medial to the temporal artery, which uh, in many cases can be, at least one branch can be, um, can be preserved. That's the point of this incision. Um, this talk is um, the third in a, in a mini series on the anterolateral corridor. I've um, done, uh, it, was, it was a great, great pleasure to, to prepare two talks already on, on the uh, terrional approach, which are used to explain a bit the uh, extracranial tissue and the anterior clinoidectomy. So some, some parts I will briefly repeat because obviously they are part of this um, part of this approach and important to um, to know. Some of them um, are covered in more detail in these two webinars from January and February. Uh, obviously, in January we talked about uh, histology, the, the soft um, tissues, facial nerve, fat pad, interfacial dissection, muscle muscle preservation, all these things. This was purely based on uh, on extracranial anatomy, which is the basis for all these approaches. And will also be the base, I uh, think, for an upcoming webinar. The next one, I think, is on uh, mobilization of the lateral wall, peeling of the middle fossa, and tear petrosectomy. This is all essentially the same approach with uh, variation here towards pathology or extensive um, extension of the of the pathology addressed. And the second one on um, on anterior clinoidectomy was again an anatomical dissection of uh, the, the roof of the cavernous sinus, acubus, and dorsal triangles transition of uh, cavernous sinus structures into the orbit. So description of the superior orbital fissure and mobilization um, of the mobilization and the dura of the middle fossa via uh, incision of the orbitotemporal parosteal fold. All this was talk was, um, was uh, part of these two webinars. And I will just briefly show some pictures uh, for those um, who have not seen this um, uh, to, 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 uh, to go back 
for these um, for this animation. This is a depiction of the, as I said, the temporal branches of the facial nerve that ascend um, towards towards the um, um, peri um, or um, the uh, the frontal parietal muscle and the the uh, orbicularis oculi. Here, this is the temporal um, artery. The, this is a very nice paper, which I will not uh, detail, um, explain in detail now, which, which was part of this January webinar, which very nicely depicts uh, and explains the, the development lateral, uh, medial lateral to the, to the superior temporal line, the attachment of the temporalis muscle of the pericranium and the layers of the superficial and deep temporal fascia layers, which, uh, which engulf the, the fat pad and the facial nerve. This is essentially a relevant anatomy and functional uh, anatomy for for the interfascial dissection. This, again, uh, just briefly to revise, um, there's many techniques, this the techniques um, we are using here, which brings you in this dissection plane of the, of the profound um, um, temporalis fascia right towards the zygomatic arch, which needs to be exposed and, and mobilized. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, an anatomical uh, of, of, of technical importance in this approach. Um, mobilization of the temporalis muscle, as I said, we are exposing not only uh, the entire muscle here, we are mobilizing the muscle or the attachment of the, uh, the, the superficial part to the posterior aspect of the zygomatic arch and also extensively mobilizing for the cuts into the lateral, supralateral orbit and the, um, the inferior orbital fissure, we are mobilizing the, the extensive uh, uh, the muscle in its, in its, tusal in its tusality. This again is the uh, functional and anatomical basis for the preservation of muscles, which is not only blood supply, but also a, a nervous um, supply. This is the basis for all these approaches. Retrograde um, dissection as, as uh, described by Oikawa and, uh, and uh, um, uh, well, Oikawa, Oikawa and it's, it's established uh, technique. This um, was part of the, the webinar. Today, I will be talking about, again, but the, the special osteology of the FDOZ approach or the orbitozygomatic approach, um, the McCarty burrhole, which is um, a relevant um, um, burrhole in, in, in accessing frontal and, and um, orbital and exposing frontal and orbital to dura at the same time. I decided not to cover pneumatization of the frontal sinus because I think nowadays, um, more or less everyone is using navigation. Pneumatization is an issue in these skull-based approaches, not only for the frontal sinus, but also for the, for the, for the um, root of the zygomatic arch, for the proximity of the maxillary sinus once you do the inferior cut um, and needs to be um, controlled and addressed in any case. And also there's no landmark, there's no guidance. Um, there's, there used to be the rule that there's no pneumatized frontal sinus lateral to the um, supratrochlear and, and uh, supraorbital nerve, which is certainly not true. So in any case, I think it needs um, revision of, of uh, CT and MRI imaging before surgery and uh, needs to be addressed also with um, navigation during surgery. Briefly, I will be talking about inferior orbital fissure. Muller muscle, which is uh, which forms uh, which which closes the inferior orbital fissure, which is probably more familiar for for those of you who uh, do endoscopic approaches. Um, then uh, briefly, because uh, in my last talk about anterior clinodectomy, we covered uh, roof of the cavernous sinus. Briefly, briefly, I will be covering some of the lateral wall and again the orbital apex, since we are talking also about intraorbital surgery. Uh, the extension into the middle cranial, um, into the extracranial, extradural. Um, structures as pterygopalatine fossa or infratimbral fossa extending, uh, so pathology extending through the bone um, in, uh, via the anteromedial and anterolateral triangles. This is something that has been uh, published um, extensively by Professor Rodis in, in a few years ago. Very, extend, uh, very interesting uh, concept for, for these extradural approaches. And then briefly, because again, we are talking about orbit. Um, some of the uh, orbital intraconal space and orbital muscles. Also to understand the, the position of these structures to avoid complication, to, um, to um, just to point out these structures because um, it, is an, it is also an experience hence, it's, it's, an, it's a more extensive approach. It needs to be uh, well controlled and um, still carries some sort of morbidity, which can be uh, uh, can be minimized addressing all these uh, all these techniques, as I said, facial nerve, uh, muscle, um, and also um, avoiding orbital complications. 
So some, again, some uh, bony anatomy, we were talking about uh, the junction of the frontal bone, the tyroidal bone, the, the temporal bone with the zygomatic um, um, process, which um, is, forms the, the zygomatic arch. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, the squamma of the temporal bone. This is the uh, temporal um, extension of the zygomatic bone. This, this is the junction between maxilla and zygomatic bone knee of the, um, the greater wing of the sphenoid. And obviously this is your, your uh, familiar landmark of the terion, which is the, the lat most lateral extension of the, of, the, um, of the greater sphenoid wing with anterior fossa and middle fossa. And you have the orbital or frontal process of the zygoma and the zygomatic or orbital process of the frontal bone joining here to form the superlateral orbital rim. Again, these are the sutures forming uh, the terion, which is in a rather ill-defined point, uh, which accesses, uh, as I said, frontal and middle fossa. And we are talking about McCarthy's keyhole, which is situated normally onto, right onto the frontal sphenoidal fissure between frontal and uh, greater sphenoid wing. Here, just uh, roughly a centimeter behind the uh, zygomatic or uh, sphenoidal fissure, which is just here in the, in, the, in the, which is not shown in this picture. I couldn't find a picture with, just a skull showing this. We'll see it later when, uh, in, a, in, a, in a surgical dissection when we have the muscle removed. So this is the, the position of McCarthy's keyhole, which we'll discuss later. And this is the region of the terion. Obviously you have the junction between um, temporal process, uh, zygomatic process of the temporal bone and temporal process of the zygomatic bone here, greater sphenoid wing, all these structures of the, of the skull base. Um, we've seen this before, just again, middle fossa, um, 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 lesser wing and greater wing of the sphenoid. We have the, the region of the terion, which gives you access to the anterior fossa and the middle fossa. And in contrast to this, McCarthy in the 60s described this, this bubble, which is a bit more anterior um, in, uh, in position, as I said, on, right onto this frontal sphenoidal and um, frontozygomatics and just a centimeter behind the frontozygomatic suture, which exposes the dura of the frontal, uh, of the interior, of the interior um, um, cranial fossa, which is frontal dura and the, the periorbit. Uh, again, this is depicted here. You can see the, uh, the region of the terion from the inside on this side and from the outside here, you have the junction of, of um, greater wing and, um, and frontal bone. This is the region of the terion and the region of the McCarthy behold would be here, which brings you right into the interior fossa, but also in the orbit. Um, I will take you stepwise again. This is not a surgical description. This is um, just an anatomical primer for, for all these approaches. I will take you through, um, through this approach. As you see, this is a one piece dissection taking off um, the superlateral part of the orbit, opening the roof of the orbit, opening the lateral aspect of the orbit, entering uh, briefly here, this is inferior orbital fissure, also the space in through the uh, intratemporal fossa. Terico-palatine fossa could be here, uh, could be accessed as well. The drilling of the anteromedial and anterolateral triangles. This is the, um, the bony exposure that can be gained with this approach. Um, obviously, the extensive, uh, the, uh, the, the degree of uh, the size of the terioidal, um, terional, uh, parietal extension of this, of this cranium to me needs to be needs to be uh, addressed. Just for those uh, who are interested, I always and I always find this very interesting. Just going back to the original descriptions of these of these um, approaches, um, these are the just three or four references I put together um, with uh, some of the pictures. As I said, Haguba. Uh, I think half of this series is, is uh, basilar apex aneurysms and uh, posterior um, clinodectomy to address the petrous apex via this, uh, this basal, basal, uh, basal exposure, which is again uh, opening of the inferior orbital fissure, um, cutting the, the zygomatic arch um, and the superior lateral aspect of the orbit. This is again uh, uh, one of the original paper pictures in this paper with. Um, the muscle uh, still attached to the uh, to the craniotomy, which is a different, um, I think nowadays an ancient technique. This is a very nice paper, um, just a few years later, 1990, um, which I very much like because it has a lot of uh, intraorbital um, um, dissections and descriptions, which is obviously also an indication for this uh, or an extension of the surgery. Um, this is just um, to give you an impression of some of the 
of the literature. This is a more recent technical description, a very nice, nicely illustrated technical description, which is very close to, uh, to what we do here in Paris, um, which is um, a cut in the roof um, in um, a borehole um, uh, on the superior temporal line or depending on, uh, on how extensive the, the approach needs to be. Another one um, at the level of the root of the zygoma, and then the cuts, as we will see, towards the um, disconnecting the, the root of the zygoma. Um, Mela eminence here and disconnecting the, the supraorbital rim here, the, the frontal part, and here the zygomatic part, and disconnecting it from the from the zygoma. And this is the frontal zygomatic uh, frontal uh, zygoma uh, suture between uh, maxillary and, and spinal, which is not part of this uh, craniotomy. Um, this is a stepwise, now this is a one piece uh, stepwise anatomical description. Again, this is not a real surgery, just to show you uh, the landmarks as we described. This is the region of the terion, this is the superior temporal line, this is the squama temporalis temporal process and zygomatic process, which form the zygomatic arch. This is a bowl just slightly anterior to the root of the zygoma. This is the cut um, which disconnects the zygomatic arch is the cut to wood into the uh, inferior orbital fissure, which disconnects um, the, the inferior aspect of the, of the craniotomy. Then there's another as aspect of this uh, keyhole, which cannot be seen. This is the opening of the orbit, which is here. So this is a, a, a McCarthy burrow, which is, as I said, uh, situated in the frontal um, sphenoidal suture and just slightly posterior to the, um, the frontal zygomatic suture um, here also behind uh, inferior and, and covered by muscle uh, in this uh, aspect here. This again is um, purely anatomy. You see the arch, which has been cast uh, posteriorly, which uh, has been uh, disconnected um, from the malar eminence. Um, what's missing in this, uh, obviously, this is inferior orbital fissure, this is superior orbital fissure, is the cut uh, through, the, uh, through the sphenoid wing, which disconnects the last bit of the of the craniotomy, which we uh, we've seen in probably one of the surgical videos um, of, of uh, Sebastian Kronig later today. Briefly, um, to understand not only the anatomy but also some, some uh, potential complications or aspects that needs to be uh, that needs to be guarded during this um, this the surgery, we have the superior and inferior orbital fissure, the optic strut and the, and the maxillary strut separating the two. We have all the nerves uh, running um, the optic nerve, obviously not, and the ophthalmic artery, obviously not, but all the nerves uh, entering the, the, um, the orbit um, from the cavernous sinus. So this is the uh, orient, the, the organization of the orbital apex. And both superior and inferior optic fissure are organized in a lateral, a medial, and a lateral, middle, and a medial compartment. And then you have the extension here into the infraorbital uh, nerve and groove towards the, uh, the infraorbital foramen, which actually can be seen here. I covered this uh, orbital apex. I covered this in uh, in a recent in the recent talk about uh, glenoidectomy. Obviously, you know, to understand which nerves are at risk once you do a clinoid, which uh, sits in this position. This is uh, also important for control of the of the. Um, Orbit. I put this image in to show you the the Müller muscle, which is um, this this here. This is inferior rectus muscle. This is um, this is uh, oculomotor nerve with uh, with a ciliary ganglion, inferior and superior branch. And this is abducens nerve, so this is a right side lateral perspective. But you can very nicely see the the this muscle this muscle, which is um, um, uh, it's a, re a remnant in, in humans, a remnant which um, closes, uh, closes like, a, like fibrous tissue, the uh, inferior orbital fissure, which is partially exposed once you dissect orbit from the outside to mobilize, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, de to, uh, to deconnect periorbit um, and, and expose the inferior orbital fissure for the last cut. This is again anatomy, but purely um, um, a stepwise, uh, a stepwise dissection, just to show you some of the aspect. This is a one-piece FTOZ. Now we see uh, again a keyhole, which is um, on the front, um, on the frontal um, sphenoidal fissure behind the frontal the zygomatic fissure. Here, this is a, this is uh, exposed um, dura of the uh, periorbit. Um, uh, you would you would see from an, a different angle. You would see frontal dura here. This is the cuff, which is a technical variation. You can use uh, small uh, bow holes also, uh, also to, um, to to reconnect the muscle. This is um, a bow hole towards the uh, the root of the zygoma. 
and the mobilized uh, muscle, which is which is here, you can see zygomatic or uh, foramen of uh, of the lateral orbit. Again, this is the 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 one piece um, FTOZ, a zygomatic arch, um, disconnected from the malar eminence, the the lateral and superior aspect of the orbit. You see the uh, supraorbital foramen or notch exposed here needs to be controlled in surgery, needs to be drilled or controlled, uh, elevated with a pericranium to, to reserve the nerve. And then your standard um, your standard craniotomy towards the posterior aspect. This is um, one of the few integral pictures. Just to give you an idea, this is uh, access to the orbit, obviously um, access to sylvian fissure, frontal and temporal lobe, all the systolic space, um, more posterior trajectory towards, as I said, towards posterior fossa, um, also petrous apex drilling of the posterior clino, its anterior clino uh, towards the orbit, and the floor could be extended um, towards extracranial pathologies. This is a two-piece FTOZ. There's, um, there's no, no rule or no, uh, no reason for the numbers of, of, uh, of pieces. Um, maybe Professor Friedrich will comment on this later. This is um, there's probably just the rule that um, it, should be, uh, it should be minimal mobilization and or, um, trauma, uh, traumatic for, for the structures removed. If there's hyperostic bone, hyperostotic bone or a infiltrative bone, it probably is not reasonable to do a craniotomy in, in one piece. Um, this depends on, on preference, pathology addressed and, um, and uh, surgical uh, experience. This is just an example of a two-piece two um, FTOZ. Uh, again, in real life, this is more or less the same with the exception that the uh, supralateral roof and the cut of the zygoma is, is uh, separate in this case. And this is, all, again, as I said, we have periorbit in, um, exposed here, the supraorbital nerve exposed here, um, the, the dura around the sylvian fissure is, is exposed, and the, um, the, 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 the number of, of, of pieces um, in which you cut your craniotomies is not uh, relevant as, as long as you put it together correctly. As I said, we will be having another a webinar on um, peeling of the middle fossa floor, addressing petrous um, apex, anterior petrosectomy. Um, I will only briefly, last time I covered some of the, some of uh, Dolings and, and Hakuba's um, triangles of the superior roof when we talked about anterior clinonectomy. Just um, briefly, some of the, um, some of, of the lateral ball, I will not go into detail of, uh, of the uh, described um, um, triangles. Mullins and all of these uh, triangles. I think this is, is obsolete. Just uh, historically, it's it's uh, interesting. Um, this is uh, exposed of, of the lateral wall. Again, this is the right side. You see the uh, oculomotor triangle, which is entering in its system via the roof. You have the fourth nerve exiting the tent, and also the transition with, um, entering the cavernous sinus. The transition of, of roof and lateral wall, and you have uh, Meckel's Meckel's uh, gate with with the ganglion V1, V2, and uh, superior orbital fissure around foramen, overlap um, foramen and uh, middle meningeal artery. I show this partially. Um, this is essentially the same, exposing sixth nerve, which runs in the middle of uh, right into the cavernous sinus. Um, I show this partially to uh, just to, um, to explain the, 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 this maximal, again, this is an anatomical dissection, but it shows you the, um, the relationship um, of, of this approach, um, where you can actually enter a sphenoid sinus, you can go into the pterygopalatine fossa, you can go into the orbit, you can control a um, orbital apex, intracoronal pathology, you can uh, follow meningioma or schwannoma, extending into the infratemporal fossa, and all other pathologies that uh, might combine both extracranial and intracranial, you know, um, intradural or extradural compartments. This can be geared towards uh, towards the pathology and allows for, a, for an extensive approach if, as in this case, the pterygoid and the, the, the interior part of the middle fossa is um, drilled completely via the anteromedial natural lateral um, triangles as seen in this example. Um, this is essentially the same, just to focus on the orbital apex. You have the sphenoid sinus here. You see, uh, again, the V2 and uh, the pterygopalatine fossa, branches of the maxillary artery. Uh, infraorbital artery exiting uh, exiting here. You see, uh, you know, in this case, you don't see Miller muscle. You've seen Miller muscle before. This is the inferior um, inferior rectus and um, ciliary ganglion, all the structures intracranially, which uh, which I will be showing in a, in a moment. Um, I wanted to show a bit both uh, in, in in order to uh, 
to explain um, some of the intraorbital um, structures to, to avoid complications, because I think um, the most serious and the most frequent uh, complications of this approach probably are still the intraorbital complication once uh, periorbit is, is mobilized, if there's compression or if there's um, trauma or, or transgression of the, um, of the, um, of the periorbit. But also um, because obviously this approach can be used to address intraconal uh, pathology of the superior lateral um, um, compartments um, of the of the orbit, um, or pathology of the optic nerve, or pathology of the orbital apex. This is um, the anatomy you, you don't see in in um, the in the FTOZ approach. This is the anatomy from the outside, just to explain that there is uh, an orbital septum which closes the orbit anteriorly, you have the, the, the pericranium, which extends um, in, the, in the orbit, which forms the, the orbit. You have the attachment of the, of the lathrocanthus, which is um, Withnell's uh, ligament, which has a bony, a bony correlate here, just inferior to the frontal zygomatic uh, suture here. You have um, an intraconal and an extraconal um, part of the, of the uh, lacrimal gland, which sits here supralaterally in the lacrimal fossa. This, Normally, you would not see this um, in, in your elevation of the um, of the periorbit, but it needs to be uh, it needs to be known, and and also it's important to know that usually the the connection of um, or the the attachment of the of essentially all these structures um, with Whitnell's ligament and, and the attachment here towards the bone are mobilized once you peel and, and medialize the um, the periorbit in order to expose your inferior orbital fissure intra intra um, in the, in the orbit. So this is the bony structure I talked about. This is the, uh, the bony correlate of, of the uh, fibrous attachment of Whitnell's ligament, which, is, uh, which forms the, the lateral canthus and the uh, apparatus of the lid. Um, all the intraorbital structures, pericranial, uh, periorbit, fat, all this has been removed. But um, this dissection, uh, this is also one of the reasons why I include this has been done. And in this within, within uh, FTOZ, you can see the frontal cut, you can see the cut. Um, through the um, zygomatic bone, you can see the, the bohol, the lateral cut um, inferior to, to the orbit, disconnecting um, the orbital rim um, and understanding the, uh, the orientation of the muscles within the orbit. You see the, the, uh, the, the uh, hypomnochlion of the superior oblique. You see the superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior oblique, uh, inferior rectus, which runs here. Um, so all these structures exposed. Um, also uh, superorbital nerve, supertrochlear nerve in the superior medial quadrant of the orbit, which is uh, in any case the, the, medial, um, the medial margin for the, for the, for the bony cut. Uh, a more lateral perspective, again, uh, this is um, superior levator and superior rectus. You have the superior oblique, medial rectus, um, so inferior rectus, uh, lateral rectus. This is again the, the, the keyhole which, which uh, corresponds to the McCarthy keyhole. Here you can very see uh, very nicely see the, the lateral rectus muscle, also remnants of Müller muscle, which is again this is the uh, the region of of the cut towards the um, originating from the inferior orbital fissure, and you see the intraorbital nerve, which exits, uh, exits here by the intraorbital foramen, and same for the supraorbital foramen and supratrochlear nerves, which run, uh, run in the supramedial aspect of the orbit. Very briefly, um, just to, to orient you, within the orbit, this is a superior um, uh, aspect of a, of a right orbit. You can uh, see the medial rectus, you can see the, um, the, the, the sensitive um, thermic a super supertrochlear and, and superorbital um, nerve, which runs here. This is the lacrimal nerve, which has been cut. Lacrimal uh, gland has been removed, sits here. This is the levator palpebralis superior, superior um, elevator, um, and underneath the, um, the superior rectus. And these are the, the, the spaces that can be used to address interconal pathologies, so optic nerve gliomas, hemangioblastomas, whatever resides in the orbit and it's to be addressed um, with this approach. Um, again, this is a uh, superior oblique nerve, which is uh, which with the transition in the supramedial aspect of, of the orbit. Um, this is the superior rectus um, mobilized and cut to expose the optic nerve, um, ciliary artery, and all the vasculature, ciliary ganglion of the uh, retroorbital space. This is ciliary ganglion. You have um, the lateral rectus here, inferior rectus, 
the lateral rectus obtusens uh, nerve here has been cut to, um, to open the obtusens nerve. You have the um, superior and inferior trunks of the, um, of the uh, ocular motor nerve with the ciliary ganglion. This is intraocular anatomy. And again, Muller muscle closing the, um, the, the orbit towards the, um, towards the infratemporal fossa, closing the, the, the space of the, uh, of the uh, inferior orbit fissure. And these are um, infraorbital nerves uh, V2 running towards the uh, intraorbital foramen. This was just a brief uh, overview of all this anatomy that can be addressed. Uh, as usual, I think all my, uh, all my mentors in uh, anatomy and in surgery here, uh, so in Frilich in Paris and, and uh, Juan Fernandez Miranda, where I did um, all this work in, in uh, Pittsburgh at the time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for this outstanding lecture. As usual, uh, you show very nicely the anatomy. It was very interesting to, to see the intraorbital anatomy as well, to remember it and to discuss the, the different complications. I have just one question on a practical point of view, just to know, I think everybody will be interested with that. How long does it take for you to prepare such images? Those are amazing, and I expect a lot of of hours and even weeks to prepare such image. Yeah, orbit is, orb, yeah, orbit takes very long because orbit is um, also different, dif difficult to photograph. I don't know whether you have seen this small metal pins. Yeah. Because you lose all the volume when you once you remove the fat, you lose all the volume, and uh, yeah, you have to you have to dress you have to dress your specimen once you're done with the dissection. Also, dissection takes long. Um, and and you have to take care that it's not uh, not getting dry, that it doesn't change color. There's all these these That's tiny cool. aspects. It takes yeah, orbit is, is difficult. It takes long. Yeah, it's very so. impressive. So now, Sebastian, you arrive with with us uh, after your your surgery, and uh, we have now seen the the standard orbitozygomatic approach. But probably you will discuss also with us the way the approach has to be derived according to the pathology that has to be reached. So, please, I give you the floor. Thank you, Michael. Sorry for, for being late uh, today, but you had a great lecture from Stefan. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, yes. Yes, so I will focus on the, on the technical aspect of the FTOZ approach and uh, on some tips and tricks uh, of the technique I am, I am using, which is a one-piece FTOZ approach. So a lot of what I am going to say has been said already by Stefan, but uh, it will be a little bit of repetition for some of it, which is always good. So uh, about uh, the indication for uh, the FTOZ approach, uh, definitely, uh, the indications are more limited than before. Uh, when I started neurosurgery and my fellowship in the US, it was something that we were doing quite commonly for deep-seated lesion in which we wanted to avoid retraction of the brain. And uh, it was not yet a time of, uh, of keyhole surgery. It was the beginning of it, but definitely with keyhole surgery, there, there was, there is still a trend towards uh, less aggressive approach. So we are using it less than before, but still there is some good indication for uh, FTOZ approach, with, which, which is uh, an extremely important skull-based approach with uh, the most important concept of uh, skull-based surgery with it, which is we can do a lot of bony work in order to avoid brain retraction. And at the end, uh, the cost of bony work is always less than the cost of injuries to the brain. And this is why we are neurosurgeons. So as you can see on this slide, there is a trend towards uh, orbitofrontal, orbitopterional, lateral supraorbital, mini pterional, but also keyhole approach uh, for sometimes lesions that we were uh, treating with an FTOZ. Uh, so here in, uh, in, in pink, you have the big FTOZ. In green, you have the subfrontal approach. But still, it's, uh, it's, there is room for both. 
and uh, it's uh, something we use uh, in in uh, in Paris in my team. Uh, I use quite often keyhole approach. I use sometimes FTOZ. It gives different uh, advantages and it's made for different type of lesion. With the keyhole approach, you have one entry point and you can browse quite a wide uh, area of the anterior skull base and also of uh, the middle skull base. But the uh, entry point is in the same area. It's a single entry point. Uh, with the FTOZ, you can have very uh, multiple line of sight. As you can see on this slide, you can look at the tumor from different perspective, which is great for some tumors with critical structure around, for which uh, with a keyhole approach, you don't necessarily have the good line of sight to see what you are doing. So again, the goal of those approaches is to protect the brain. And if you feel that with an FTOZ, you will uh, have less retraction, less lesion to the brain, to the cranial nerve, then it's a good option. Uh, what makes the exposure is, is not only bone. And uh, I have seen uh, uh, several times colleagues, fellows, focusing on the bony work and uh, forgetting the, the, the soft tissue part of the approach. Uh, to expose the bone, you need to have a proper soft tissue dissection. On the soft tissue dissection, the soft tissue elevation should not obscure, should not be in the way of the line of sight that will be given by the bony work. Otherwise, you, the bony work you have done is for nothing. So it's extremely important, most important to have a proper soft tissue dissection and then the bony work uh, the, 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 the bone flap, the drilling, according to the exposure you got with the soft tissue. So what does it give? It gives a wide exposure of the skull base. You get closer from the critical structure. With a keyhole approach, you are quite far from the critical structure. Uh, if you need to turn around a tumor uh, with critical structure around, it's nice to have a shorter distance and the FTOZ approach is made for this. Uh, you also have a lower line of sight. You can look at the inferior surface of the frontal lobe from below uh, and, and you can have a fantastic exposure of the cavernous sinus, orbital apex, superorbital fissure, cavernous orbital junction without any brain retraction. Uh, for a tumor like this, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a case I've done quite a long time ago, but I think it would come again today. I would do it the same way. Uh, it's a metastasis, single mat of a patient uh, that was uh, getting blind, young patient. We wanted to reduce the, the, the mass effect of this tumor before radiation therapy. And you can see the optic nerve, optic chiasma around this tumor. It's better to come from below in a case like this. I didn't want it to come endoscopic uh, because it's a mat and it's bleeding a lot. And uh, it's a small tumor, but for which FTOZ, I think, has some advantages. One of my main indication, main uh, uh, concept I am using for FTOZ now is the orbitotemporalis muscle corridor which means that it's not really the superior orbital rim that gives me an advantage. It's more the lateral aspect of the superior rim and the lateral rim of the orbit that uh, is good to remove with the FTOZ. Why? Because you have this oblique line of sight coming from anterior to posterior, lateral to medial, inferior to superior, looking at the inferior surface of the frontal lobe. And uh, you know that the superior wall of the orbit is, is bulging a little bit superiorly. So removing the superior aspect, the superior orbital rim, in fact, doesn't necessarily give you much in terms of lower line of sight. But this more lateral line of sight given by the removal of the lateral orbital rim is, is really nice. And this is one of my main indications for FTOZ now. 
How do you get to this line of sight? With the FTOZ, you expose the orbit, obviously, and you push the temporalis muscle inferiorly and laterally, and you create a corridor like this with this blue line between the orbit, between the retracted temporalis muscle to look at the inferior surface of the frontal lobe. Fantastic exposure, for example, giant uh, clinoidal meningioma. This is a dissection of it. You see here that this line is not going through the superior rim, but it's really going through the lateral rim and a little bit uh, using the corridor of the body of the maxilla. And you can see here that looking through this line of sight, you really have a view of the inferior aspect of the frontal lobe. If you have a tumor inside, you can look at this tumor without any retraction of the frontal lobe. This is, I think, a CT scan of uh, Rosaria uh, Abriti specimen dissection. She's one of my uh, colleagues, and she did a work on this with, uh, with some measurements. And uh, this is exactly here, the corridor in red that you gain with this FTOZ, retraction of the temporalis muscle inferiorly and posteriorly, and removal of the lateral rib. This is an example of it where uh, we use the neural navigation and you see that the probe is really passing between the orbit, between the temporalis muscle, and there is zero retraction uh, before we get to the tumor base of this tumor. And you see how deep is this tumor uh, surrounded completely by the frontal lobe. So to avoid brain retraction, it's uh, the only way uh, to go with this FTOZ on removal of the lateral rim of the orbit. This was uh, the case. The epicenter of a lesion like this is really the anterior clinoid process. You can see here all the feeders. It was quite a bloody tumor with a big blush. So again, getting to the tumor base without any retraction or limited retraction uh, first is definitely an advantage. And this was a post-op MRI of this patient with, uh, uh, I would say, no injury of the parenchyma. This was another case where FTOZ to me is, is great. If you, if you use a classic frontotemporal approach, you really need to open widely the sylvian fissure. Still, you have a edema of the frontal lobe which is quite fragile at the end of the surgery. Uh, extremely difficult not to have some injury of the parenchyma frontal lobe, temporal lobe. We are on the right side. I would say it's acceptable, but on the left side, it could be definitely an issue with the FTOZ approach, with this lateral rim of the orbit removal, this corridor between orbit and temporalis muscle that we use, we have an access to the tumor base. We can debulk first uh, without any retraction of, uh, of uh, the brain. This is a case, uh, a series that is in preparation showing some tumors like this, <coughs> where we use the FTOZ approach for those tumors, you can see that it's a significant size tumor for most of it. Uh, so extent of resection with this approach is, is quite good. It's not 100%, but 75% of gross total resection or near total resection and uh, no complication in terms of brain injury. Another advantage of the FTOZ approach is that it gives you a wide exposure of the skull base, give you a wide exposure of the orbit, caverno orbital junction, but also of the temporal fossa floor. Once you have retracted the temporal is muscle very low because you remove the zygoma, so you can really retract more the temporal is muscle, which is kind of a door that open to expose the floor of uh, the temporal fossa, especially the anterior aspect of the temporal fossa floor. This was a case where we used this approach for a uh, 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 resection of this uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma where we did a cavernous sinus exanteration. So for a tumor like this, if you want to do uh, oncological resection, which is questionable for adenoid cystic carcinoma, I agree, 
But here we wanted to, to try to, to give a chance to this patient and, and FTOZ was perfect for this because you have a superior exposure of all the part of the tumor. Uh, let me see something. I am missing a few slides. Uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I was confused. Um, so one of the uh, structure, I, I will go now in the step-by-step -step technique of the OSTOZ as I, I do it myself uh, in, in the OR. One of the critical structure to protect during the soft tissue dissection is the frontal branch of the fascial nerve. I'm sure Stefan showed you uh, some of his pictures. This is one of his pictures, I believe where you can see all the bundles of uh, the fascial nerve. This is running in the subcutaneous tissue and it has to be protected with a proper technique. So this is a bony anatomy. I will not go over this again. This is a classic incision for a frontotemporal approach. If you want to do an FTOZ, you have to make a bigger incision because if you draw a line between the two extremities of this classic frontotemporal incision, and you cannot expose here the body of the zygoma lateral rim of the orbit or superior rim. If you want to expose the bone anteriorly, you need either to go lower at the level of the, of the, of the tragus, in front of the tragus, or you have to go on the opposite side. The two extremities, the lines that join the two extremities need to go through at least this posterior aspect here of the body of the zygoma. Otherwise, you will have a very hard time to expose the bone and you will need a huge amount of retraction, which is not good for the soft tissue. So if you want to extend your incision inferiorly, you can do it, but you have to do it as posterior as possible along the tragus. Because if you are too anterior, one centimeter in front of the tragus, quite rapidly below the level of the zygoma, you will get close to the frontal branch, the, the superior, the most superior branch of the frontal branches of the fascial nerve. Usually you don't cut it, but you can easily injure it when you try to coagulate some venous bleeding or arterial bleeding in this area when you extend the incision down. So the more posterior you are, the best it is. And you can go almost one centimeter below the level of the zygoma without much risk of injury to the frontal branch. And it allows you to retract the skin more anteriorly and to expose the bone. Once you have elevated the skin flap, you elevate the periostome here, uh, classic way. I think we all do that. It's always good in skull-based surgery to have this tissue intact to be able to replace the dura post op if needed. Then uh, you need to separate the skin flap from the temporalis muscle because we will retract the skin flap anteriorly, the temporalis muscle posteriorly, and we have to expose here the lateral rim of the orbit. So in order to do that without injury to the frontal branch, we need to do either an interfascial dissection in red or a subfascial dissection in black because the frontal branch is here into the subcutaneous tissue. So we need to go at least below the superficial temporalis fascia here. So either with interfascial or deeper with uh, subfascial dissection. I personally prefer the interfascial dissection. How I do it? I make an incision here of the, of the tissue along the, the, the superior temporal line. I tracked here with a pincette, the superficial temporalis fascia. I put the tip of my scissor below and I cut the superficial temporalis fascia down. I expose here this fat. I go then deep into this fat uh, and, and, uh, and I cut, I expose the deep fascia and I follow the deep fascia down uh, towards the lateral rim of the orbit. This is a small video. Here you see that I cut the superficial fascia. Most important is not to dissect here <coughs> in this area because quite rapidly you can find the frontal branch. So we need to go deeper, cutting this fascia. We expose this fat and then we cut this fat that we push anteriorly until we see here the deep fascia. The deep fascia is a bright fascia, easily uh, easy to identify here. You see it here, it's, it's, it's really uh, white. 
and you follow it anteriorly and you get directly to the bone. This is quite an old video, but the technique is exactly the same uh, that the one I am doing now. So after cutting the superficial fascia, you expose the deep fascia, you follow it anteriorly, but most important, you don't work here in this area between the skin and the pancet because this is where you find the frontal branch. Once again, on a cadaver, once you have retracted the skin flap anteriorly and you cannot retract more, instead, if you cut with a knife, you push with a sponge, and at some point, it doesn't go forward uh, anymore. So that's time to stop. That's time to incise the superficial fascia and to follow the deep fascia. You don't want to work in this area because here you will start to see some bundle, some fascicle of the frontal branch. So then mobilization of the temporalis muscle. Mobilization of the temporalis muscle. I make an incision all around the incision of the temporalis muscle. I don't want to cut through the muscle, at least uh, uh, the minimum, because everything that is behind the line that transects the muscle is dead tissue. So this is how I do it. I really take the entire temporalis muscle with me because I want to preserve all the fibers. And then I do a retrograde dissection of the temporalis muscle fibers with this instrument, sharp angle instruments from down up, down up. I follow the direction of the muscle fibers, but most important, I start down and I go up towards the superior temporal line, like in this little cartoon. And that's the instrument I am using. I use the sharp angle of this instrument contact with the bone. This video is not working, but I have another one after. And then once you have done it, you have to free the muscle completely. You have to cut the deep temporalis fascia that is attached to the periostom of the lateral rim of the orbit and to the zygomatic arch. You cut this periostom here, this, super, this deep temporalis fascia. Like this, you can completely flip the muscle back and forth. Next step is the superiorstal exposure of the bone. Superiorstal is mandatory if you want to avoid bleedings. Whenever you're, you're stuck to the bone, it bleeds much less. And what is bleeding can be easily stopped with bone wax. Here, be careful to the uh, supraorbital nerve here going through its canal. And again, the superiorstal dissection here at the level of the rim is the best way to preserve the pair orbital. If you are not superiorstal here at the level of the rim, you will not be uh, superiorstal with the periorbital, which means that you will open the periorbital. Elevation of the periorbital is something that takes time. You need to be careful. If you open the periorbital, it's a pain uh, because the fat is coming out. And, uh, and it's obscuring your line of sight. So you don't want to have some fat coming all around here, the orbit, obscuring your surgical field. You didn't do an FTOZ for that. So in order to preserve the periorbital, it's not easy. You probably all had some uh, fat uh, exposure and, uh, and you know it's a pain. So what I do now is that I change the position of my microscope in order to see the tip of my instrument, to see the tip of my instrument against the bone and progressively I elevate the periorbita. I'm not going too deep, too fast. I progressively elevate the periorbita from the superior wall, lateral wall of the orbit. The next step is to find uh, then the inferior orbital fissure. This is key if you want to do a, a one-piece FTOZ. Uh, super lateral aspect of the inferior orbital fissure, you find it uh, deep into the temporal fossa uh, at the under surface of the temporalis muscle here. If you go deep, at some point, you will find a defect. This is a defect of the lateral aspect of the inferior orbital fissure. On the other side of the, this defect, you have the orbit. So you can find the same defect moving down with a dissector along the superior wall, the lateral wall of the orbit. At some point, like this dissector, you will find a defect and you will enter the temporal fossa. <clears throat> uh, then another important uh, keyhole uh, structure to, to do 
is the McCarthy keyhole. The McCarthy keyhole is a burr hole that exposes both the periorbit and the frontal dura. How I do it? I put my dissector into the orbit because I have elevated the periorbital already, and it will give me the direction, the direction towards which I should drill to expose the periorbital. So I start with my drill. I use diamond drill, cutting uh, coarse diamond for a coarse diamond to drill in the direction of my dissector. Not too low, because if you are too low here, you will have a huge burr hole to expose also the temporal dura. So you have to envision the position of the frontal dura here to make the first part of your McCarthy keyhole not too far from the frontal dura. Once you have done this opening of the orbit, you go uh, on the other direction to expose the temporal dura, and you will have periorbital frontal dura on this bridge of bone in between, which is the superior wall of the orbit. <laughs> two other burr hole, two or three or four, what, what, whatever you need to preserve the dura matter. The number of burr hole is only made to preserve the dura matter once uh, when you elevate the bone flap. So if it's an, uh, an, an old patient, uh, you do have to do more burr hole because the dura is stuck to the bone usually. First cut is an oblique cut at the level of the zygomatic arch. Here, posteriorly, it should be oblique. You should not leave a piece of zygoma arch because it will be very difficult to lower the temporalis muscle. Be careful, sometimes you open air cells, you have to put some bone wax. A second cut is a cut from the inferior orbital fissure that we have exposed to the orbital part of the McCarthy keel. What you cut here is the lateral orbital wall from FTOZ here, uh, inferior orbital fissure here to the orbital part of the McCarthy keel. Uh, I use a B1 foot plate, but I am not using in this direction. I am putting the B1 first down and I go up. Uh, the third cut is a cut of the body of the zygoma. Here, you need someone to help you to retract the skin flap. Uh, you expose here a small foramina with, a, with an artery on the nerve. It's a zygomatic facial foramen. It's usually one centimeter here from the angle between the frontal process of the zygoma and the zygomatic process of the zygoma. Uh, it's about one centimeter. It's important landmark because you should not cut uh, more than, than this line, dotted line, because otherwise you can open the maxillary sinus. Then you do a big cut between the temporal burr hole here to the orbital rim. Uh, if you stop here at the level of the McCarthy keyhole, it will be a two-piece FTOC. If you want to do one piece, you have to go towards the orbital rim, lateral to the supraorbital nerve. Look at your CT scan before. You don't want to open the frontal sinus in an FTOZ for a big skull-based cases. It adds risk of CSF leakage and infection. And then you take your B1 foot plate on the opposite direction uh, towards the end of your previous cut like this. The final cut is the cut of the orbital roof. I take some small chisel to cut the orbital roof. Uh, in the same direction than the orbital rim here. And at some point it will break. The last attachment is the lesser wing of the sphenoids that you can drill a little bit and then you progressively crack it. You crack it and you progressively elevate the bone flap to have this type of exposure. So one piece FTOZ is a technique I just presented you. Uh, I am not doing the two or three pieces uh, FTOZ. I am sometimes tailoring my, my approach, which means I am just doing a one piece orbitoterional approach or terional and zygomatic arch together, but I usually try to do one piece. This is also techniques, two pieces, taking only the zygoma out or taking here the zygoma plus the uh, orbital rib. This is the final exposure you have uh, after you have done your FTOZ and you have taken a little bit of bone drill, the bone of the pterion until you reach the superorbital fissure. This is done extremely rapidly with a ranger. 
You can peel the periorbita, peel the dura, take a big longer, and you take all this bone off. And you have in, in five minutes this beautiful exposure of temporal dura, frontal dura orbit. What are the next steps? From here, and this is also the beauty of this approach, you can easily get to the clinoid process. Here is uh, the orbitotemporal periostal fold on the clinoid. Here, uh, you can peel the dura from uh, the clinoid process. You can cut the uh, uh, orbitotemporal periostal fold, peel the lateral wall of the carinal sinus a little bit to increase the exposure of the clinoid process and drill it uh, with the proper technique. Another uh, region you can easily access is the temporal fossa floor. Here, uh, if you retract the temporal is muscle downward, you can do it easily because we have removed the zygoma. You peel the temporal dura a little bit from the temporal fossa floor, and you, add, you have a rapid access to the anteromedial and anterolateral triangles between V1 and V2, V2 and V3. This is really great. This is the case I showed you at the beginning uh, uh, of exonteration through the temporal fossa floor. Fantastic access to the sphenopalatine fossa, infratemporal fossa, and paranasal sinuses. So anteromedial in red, anterolateral in green. This is a cartoon. You can have an easy access to the sphenoid sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoid through those corridors. This is uh, V1, V2 corridors, giving you an exposure to sphenoid sinus, uh, posterior ethmoid here, and maxillary sinus anteriorly. Uh, anterolateral triangle, both sides of vidian nerves that you can unroof through the pterygoid process. On the same, you have a great access to sphenoid sinus, but also to the parapharyngeal space if needed here between V2 and vidian nerve. I show you here a video of the FTOZ. <coughs> uh, so this is a quite old video, but it's still, uh, it's still uh, nice uh, for, for teaching. Uh, elevation here of the skin flap. You see that I stop when I cannot push the skin flap more anteriorly. Make this incision here uh, along the superior temporal line. Incision all along the insertion of the temporalis muscle. Uh, usually now I do this incision after the interfacial dissection, but uh, uh, here I change the order. Um, here is the interfacial dissection, elevation of the superior fascia, and I am cutting down uh, towards the root of the zygoma, the superficial layer. You see this fat, you cut this fat, you usually have a big vein here in the middle uh, that you need to coagulate, expose the deep fascia, uh, towards the lateral orbital rim, elevation of the periostom. Superiostal exposure of the bone, it needs uh, retraction. Uh, someone needs to help you with retraction. And you cut here at some point the deep uh, temporalis fascia attached to the zygoma and attached to uh, the lateral orbital rim because the next step will be elevation of the temporalis muscle. But here I have the zygomatic body, zygomatic arch down, lateral uh, orbital rim. Uh, elevation of the periorbita, as I said before, I am watching the tip of my instruments. Uh, I change the position. I am quite often using the microscope now to do that. It takes a little bit more time, but if you uh, don't open the periorbita, it's a lot of time that you gain uh, for the rest of the case. Here, retrograde dissection of the temporalis muscle. <coughs> uh, the goal is really to preserve this deep periostal layer that protects the veins, the arteries, and nerve for the temporalis muscle. They are deep to this white fascia. So if you don't preserve this fascia, you will injure those nerve on arteries and you will have for sure temporalis muscle atrophy. Is it an issue? Cosmetically, it's not very nice. And most likely patient will complain the year after of TNG pain. So it's important to preserve the temporalis muscle. We use it every day 
to eat, to speak. So it's an important uh, muscle. Here is a detachment from the zygomatic arch after cutting the deep temporalis fascia. So now the, the muscle is completely detached from the bone, but it's quite intact. It's between two aponevrosis and the bundles for, uh, of uh, arteries, nerves are intact. McCarthy keyhole, I drill in the direction of my uh, dissector into the orbit. And uh, once I have the orbit, I drill in the opposite direction towards the, the frontal dura. I have a bridge of bone in between, that's the orbital roof. Temporal burr hole, frontal burr hole, nothing special about it. Again, the more burr hole you do, the less risk you will have to injure the dura. Uh, and it's always good for closure. First cut, the zygomatic cut, as posterior as possible, oblique cut. <clears throat> you want to take all the zygoma out to be able to retract the temporalis muscle. The cut of the lateral wall of the orbit, cut of the body of the zygoma now. Someone is helping me retracting the skin flap, and I use this retractor as a roller to do the cut. I don't finish it with this drill. I finish it with uh, a chisel. Then frontotemporal bone cut. I end this cut at the orb superorbital rim lateral to the frontal supraorbital nerve. Here is, uh, is uh, uh, cut in the opposite side. And now a cut of uh, the sphenoid ridge. Uh, final cut is the orbital roof cut. And here is a bone flap removal. <clears throat> Takes a little bit of time and you have to cut the insertion here of the masseter muscle uh, that are attached to the posterior aspect of the zygoma. I show you two cases. This was a giant aneurysm uh, pushing up the chiasma. It was a, a clinoidal segment aneurysm and, uh, and, uh, uh, and also carotidophthalmic. Uh, this patient was blind of the, on the other side because of the small stroke, because of thrombosis. So you had only one eye and uh, the uh, and, uh, neuroradiologists were scared to uh, do an endovascular treatment of this aneurysm because if it grows a little bit, patient would have been blind. So we decided to do surgery on it. FTOZ uh, to have a wide exposure of this area of the skull base where the aneurysis is. And I also did a bypass, protective bypass uh, for this patient. Uh, STA, MCA bypass, it was enough, considered enough for this patient. We thought he didn't need it, a high flow bypass. This is the FTOZ approach, uh, incision all around the muscle, retrograde dissection of the temporalis muscle, same than before. <laughs> Here you see that I am looking at the tip of my dissector for the elevation of the periorbita. That's the only way to preserve the periorbita. McCarthy keyhole here with one part exposing periorbita, the other exposing uh, frontal dura. This is a cut of the lateral orbital rim. Uh, this is now, once the bone flap is removed, drilling off uh, the pterion. I am peeling here the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus to expose here the clinoid process. I did an optic nerve uh, and roofing, optic canal and roofing. I wanted to decompress the optic nerve first before manipulating the aneurysm. And I wanted also to have an exposure to the clinoidal segment of the ICA. This is clinoidal segment of the ICA proximal to the aneurysm. I tried to put, to put a clip here, but it was not possible because it was too big. This is proximal ring here. And it was, it was too much, too, too big still 
It was the beginning of the aneurysm. So what I did, I will show you in a, in a minute. I went to the Petrus ICA. Here is the exposure of the aneurysm, exposure of the optic nerve. Uh, you can see something very interesting now is uh, how uh, this is the aneurysm, yes, the tip of the aneurysm with uh, the MCA coming out of this, uh, coming out of it. And here it's really the tip of the aneurysm. I wanted to be sure that the, the PCOM on anterior corridor was, uh, was exposed. And here I just cut the falciform ligament. You see the print that the falciform ligament did on the optic nerve. <laughs> I am now doing the bypass, fish mouse of the STA, classic uh, bypass here, uh, because the treatment of the aneurysm was uh, trapping, clip proximal, clip distal. So you need to bring some flow in this patient. <coughs> Two extremity stitches first, and then I am not doing running suture for uh, STA, MCA, MCA, I'm doing separated stitches. Uh, okay. Anterior wall, posterior wall, this is, uh, this is a bypass. Everything is fine. I am going now subtemporal to have proximal control, very easy access to the subtemporal area because of the FTOZ. You see that I have a fantastic window given by the retraction of the temporalis muscle. I am drilling glass cock triangle to expose the carotid artery petrous ICA. So I could not put my clip at the level of the clinoidal segment. I put it at the level of the petrous ICA. The only issue was that the, the aneurysis post op was still filing a little bit with the vidian artery, but very rapidly thrombosed and completely shrink. So this is almost the end of the surgery. I make sure that the bypass is, uh, is playing its role after putting the clip on the petrous ICA. I'm quite, uh, quite happy with the flow. And I am putting now the distal clip, making sure that the anterior choroidal artery is safe here, as well as the, anterior, uh, the posterior communicating artery. So for a case like this, where you need access to multiple areas of the skull base, FTOZ approach was, was great. Final case is, is this one. I think I will skip the video because it's about the same. Uh, big clinoidal meningioma. Uh, to me, if you want to avoid retraction of the brain, have access to the origin of the meningioma, which is the clinoid process rapidly without retraction. It's a perfect approach. This case was not so easy because the carotid artery was inside as you can see here, and it's definitely uh, a, a challenge uh, to, to, to preserve a carotid and also its branches, interfacial dissection, but we saw that already, so uh, I go fast. <coughs> okay, uh, final words about complication, risk of, complica of, of having issues. Yes, there is, because you see that the uh, soft tissue dissection is extensive, risk of frontal palsy, uh, temporal muscle atrophy, CSF leakage, if you open frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, air cells on the zygomatic root, TMG disorder, if you dissect too much posteriorly, you open the joint or because of temporal muscle atrophy, Subcutaneous hematoma, you see on this picture, the temporalis muscle atrophy and infection. It's usually long cases, so you have to be extremely careful with the risk of infection. That's temporalis muscle atrophy here, not so nice as you can see it. Thank you to my team and to my fellows helping me with, uh, with all those dissection and, and work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Very impressive talk as usual. You highlight all the, the benefits of, uh, of this approach, different angle of attacks, uh, shorter corridor. You speak also about the complications. Maybe one just question, could you, could you say a few words about the more stellarate approach? When you by sample just remove the orbital rim or when you just remove the, the zygoma arch, What's, what's, your, what's your philosophy about that? 
I, I definitely tailor according to what I need. And uh, if you learn to do the one piece FTOZ approach, it's not to do the one piece FTOZ approach every time. If you know how to do the one piece FTOZ approach, it means that you can really tailor as you want. You know how to do an interfacial, you know how to do retrograde dissection, you know how to expose inferior orbital fissure, you know how to do a McCarthy keyhole, so you can do whatever you want. Once the bone is exposed, you know, the, the bony uh, removal, the bone removal depends on what you need. And sometimes, yesterday I did a craniofrangioma, I did the, the exposure like an FTOZ, but I didn't expose the zygoma and I did orb orbitopterional. McCarthy keyhole cut here, the lateral rim of the orbit, and I took all this out. So yes, you, 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 those techniques, the most important is the soft tissue dissection. If you know how to do the soft tissue dissection, then you can do the bony work tailored to the pathology. It was the size the of the bone flap, sometimes you need a big bone flap because you want to open the seed and fissure. But someone, sometimes I do an FTOZ with just a very small exposure of the frontal dura, temporal dura. It depends really of what you need. And this takes time before the surgery to plan what you will need. It was a way for me to introduce your works that I know that you made with a transpalpebral approach, transorbital approach, endoscopic assisted to some region. It was a way for me to, to allow you to comment about that. I know your work, but maybe uh, you, you, should, you, you, can take, you can take a few minutes to explain what you are doing now to extend your approach to the skill base through very limited uh, uh, corridors. You're talking about the transorbital approach. Yes, yes, yes. Transorbital approach. We are we are working on this, and uh, but the the technique is a little bit different. It's not an I lead approach because the I lead approach. I believe there may be some cosmetic issues, and as a neurosurgeon, I'm not so comfortable cutting the I lead. But what I what I know very well is the incision of the eyebrow because I am doing a good number of keyhole. So I do an eyebrow incision and then I just do a crescent shape craniotomy just of the rim itself. I am not exposing the frontal dura. I am just cutting the rim uh, with, the, with the B1 foot plate going this way, just a crescent shape. And instead of having a trajectory like this, transorbital endoscopic, I have a trajectory like this using the microscope and the endoscope. So uh, we have been using it. I, uh, I will do a case next week. I think of uh, cavernous sinus meningioma lateral wall uh, with this technique because it gives you a fantastic way to this area without a need from, for, temporal, for temporal lobe retraction. And again, all what we do as a skull base surgeon is to, to take out some, some deep-seated pathology and to protect the brain. The first goal is to protect the brain, not to expose the brain if it's not needed, not to retract if, if you have another way. That's the only goal of skull-based surgeon. If you don't do that, you're not a skull-based surgeon. Definitely. <laughs> that, that will be the, uh, the final word of this webinar, I think. <laughs> I, like, I like my conclusion. I'm going to write it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Nothing else to say from my side. <laughs> it's time to stop talking because I'm listening to myself too much now. <laughs> it's recorded. You know, you can even repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mikhail, so, thank you so much for your work and uh, an investment into those webinars because it, uh, pleasure, but, uh, it's tough uh, to organize and it's always great. It's always great to have you with us, uh, Stefan and Sebastian. Uh, I think uh, when I see the comment in the in the box, it's a, it's a very wonderful uh, webinar that you allow us to to attend. So thank you also to to attend and uh, to you, Sebastian and Stefan, to to give us such uh, wonderful talks. It will be my pleasure to to see you again uh, in a few weeks. The next webinar I think will be organized in uh, in four weeks on another school based topic. I think it will be anterior petrosectomy. So it will be my pleasure to, to see you at that time and uh, 
all of you. I see you are still uh, many to attend this uh, this webinar. So, see you soon. See you next time. See you soon. See you Sebastian, soon. I give you a phone call right now. I have to go back to the OR. I call oh. you. I call you after. Okay. Okay, that's great. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye. -bye.